you are looking at the analysis of drug alcohol crime measures, a case study in Ghana. Uh, precisely, I did this work at the Kumase Central Prisons and then with the Ghana Police Service at the Central Police in Kumase. So um, let me zoom in because time is fast spent. So the scope of the presentation, I'll touch on the introduction. And the introduction, I have some key points we have to uh, look at, um, looking at some mechanisms, uh, effect of cocaine on neurotransmitters. So example, I choose dopamine and then serotonin, and then metabolic pathway of THC in the body. Then we also look at the root of transaction or trafficking of illicit uh, drugs statement of so most of the presentation will be here because i don't want us to go through the normal uh, work again though we will look at the normal work but i want us to uh, focus more on this uh, key points and highlight before we move to the statement of problem aim objective methods results discussion and etc so um so my introduction we say we're talking about drugs, and um, we say that the link between drugs and crime exists in multiples of ways, and the link could be direct or indirect. Um, I hope I have my audience from other countries. Now, in Ghana, um, when you are caught in possession of drug, it's a crime. So the direct link could be trafficking of the drug or the substance, um, possession, using, cultivation or manufacturing, and then also distribution. If you are involved in any of these, that means uh, you, 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 you face the law. So it's a crime in Ghana here. Now, when we talk of the indirect linkage, now this indirect link is what the drug causes you or influence you to do. You see? So someone may say that, oh, as for murder, you can just go and kill and come out and go scot-free without anything, without using any substance. Please, it doesn't occur. It is hard sometimes to look at um, your fellow human being and butcher the person and say there is nothing uh, being influenced. In most of the cases, um, as recorded by the police, murder, uh, after murder, the search, I mean, involve... Um, findings like drugs and other weapons, other substance. So drug influences a lot. So indirectly, people normally, you know, they've conceived their mind in their mind that they want to cause murder. But at the same time, the courage to go, you see, the drug takes away that fear, the fear in them so that they can act or they can pursue the action. So indirect link, one is murder, rape. So in this work that I did, I interviewed a lot of inmates, and most of them confess that, oh, sometimes to rape somebody, um, you need to put in some substance so that you can gather courage and do that. So rape, for instance, is, is another form of uh, indirect link. And then we have people who are addicted to these drugs. Uh, of course, if you're addicted to something, you have to find ways and means to get it uh, available all the time. So the supplies, the substance, supplying the substance or your need is also another matter. So people do pickpocketing, theft, burglaries, simple, simple stealing. Uh, they are not simple as you may think. Your phone will be there, someone will come and pick it up, um, it's, it's something we're experiencing all the time, but we take it uh, as a joke. Eh? 
you'll be with somebody in the house uh, before you realize your clock is gone, your television is gone, your fan is gone. Uh, I mean, a drug addict can break into your room and just pick an item, just a simple item and go and sell. Uh, this is for the person to be able to what? Continue the habit just to buy drug. Drug addicts, they sell all their properties to make sure that they continue in the habit. So after selling, they have to find ways and means, which is the stealing, burglary, and other things. So uh, don't joke with drug addicts. Um, they, 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 they. So these are the indirect uh, link that, some of the indirect link that uh, drugs can lead to uh, in terms of criminal offending. Now, Johnson et al. published that heroin abusers commit a variety of crimes such as robbery, burglary, etc. And the main motivation is to obtain money for the drugs. That is the main motivation. They just want to continue the habit. It is non-stoppable. So illicit drugs are used by millions of individuals throughout the world. And both their effects and the nature of illicit uh, drugs market place major burden on health and society. This was a report by the United Nations uh, um, Drug and Crime Office, uh, United Nations Office on Drug and Crime uh, in 2008. And then globally, about 200 million people make illicit use of one type of illicit drug uh, substance or another. And uh, cannabis <laughs> being the most commonly used drug, followed by amphetamine, cocaine, and the opioids. This is also a report by the United Nations Office uh, on Drug and Crime. So you could see that cannabis, I mean, is, I mean, globally, cannabis lead, it tops the game on drugs use followed by amphetamine. You know, in Africa, amphetamines are not too common, so common, as in the United States. For the States, they use amphetamine and then met a lot, and they are stimulants, these two substances. Uh, amphetamine, met is gotten from uh, um, amphetamine, yes. And then cocaine and then the other opioids. Now we're looking at highlights and key points governing substance use a neurotransmitter release. Of course, you see, one of the mechanisms um, you need to understand um, about these drugs um, is about how they function in the body. So let's look at A, cocaine mechanisms. When cocaine is taken in, what happens? What happens? So this simple mechanism here, um, I hope you can see the Kaiser. Yeah. Okay. So when cocaine is taken in, this is what happened. This is a simple uh, 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 neuron trying to transmit. This is a neuron trying to transmit message across uh, a synapse to another what? A neuron. That is in the brain side. So when cocaine is uh, taken in, it, it influences uh, much uh, uh, dopamine and the uh, synaptic cleft. This is what we call the synaptic cleft. This is the presynaptic, and then this is the postsynaptic. Now, this is a vesicle. These vesicles are always baked with uh, dopamine dopamine substance and dopamine is a neurotransmitter that gives pleasure more pleasure so when you have dopamine when you gain dopamine you will feel good you will feel euphoric more pleasurable that kind of behavior happiness that is what dopamine uh, does to the, the the body so dopamine is released it's released into this space called the synaptic space and then the purpose is to bind to receptors here. So the dopamine will bind to the receptors here so that the message will be transmitted. So in the natural sense, without taking cocaine, this is what happens. When uh, you, you, you get your nice food that you like, dopamine will be released. 
uh, when you are watching your nice movie or music, dopamine will be released. But these are normal uh, physiological uh, brain duties. So the neuromuscular, uh, one, uh, the presynaptic end will transmit these uh, neurons to um, the postsynaptic uh, nerve ending so that the message will be what? Transmitted. Now, if you look at um, here, when cocaine is bonded, no, the natural sense, um, the dopamine is cleared out in a few minutes. You have the feelings in a short while. Then the dopamine is cleared out from the uh, synaptic cleft, this side, by the dopamine transporter. This is the dopamine transporter. So it will pick all the dopamine and send back to these vesicles for repackaging so that it will be reused in another cycle. But when cocaine is in, what cocaine does is that it will, it will increase the production of dopamine. And then this is what it does. As dopamine will be released and dopamine will be prevented from being reuptake by dopamine what? Transporter. So the cocaine blocks the transporter from doing its normal physiology. So, so this is what happens. Here, dopamine receptor antagonist. An antagonist, you know what an antagonist does. So it acts like the dry mimics, but it is not. So it is preventing the action to be what? Taken. So when it happens like this, dopamine will build up here and then the drug effect will be felt. That euphoria, that kind of uh, feelings that the cocaine uh, abusers normally get will be felt much more until the drug is taken away. So in this continuous, will lead to addiction and then the desire for more drugs. So when we come here to be serotonin, serotonin is a mood uh, engagement uh, uh, neurotransmitter. It also causes happiness. Uh, it, 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 it causes a lot of mood changes in persons. So the same thing is done here. So these vesicles here will release this uh, uh, serotonin neurotransmitters, and then they will bind to receptors here. But after binding, you know, after sending the message, you have to go back to where you came from. But cocaine is binding with the serotonin transporter and preventing the transporter from doing its normal work by re uh, I mean, taking, picking them up and then repackaging them into the vesicle for another cycle. So this is what the drug cocaine does when someone takes it. And is is this mechanism that, uh, that happens and we say, oh, this person is high, this person is this and that. So that is that. Then we also look at uh, cannabis, the metabolic pathway of uh, the cannabis drug. Now, when, when cannabis is taken, now let me see the main substance in cannabis, the active ingredient in a weed or marijuana plant, is this delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol, uh, the uh, cannabinoic acid, sorry. This one is what is the active substance. But just this one alone, if does not break down, cannot give you the psychoactive substance that causes the high that we all know. So when this is administered by vaping or smoking, uh, this substance is decarboxylated into the psychoactive substance so that that is the ingredient that causes the person to feel high instantaneously. That is during um, um, smoking. You know, the lungs will absorb and then the heart which will be distributed to the heart. The heart will pump it to the other parts of the uh, system or the body. 
So by when it is taken in uh, orally, um, this is what we get. This one is uh, hydrolyzed to this alcohol. So in hydrolyzed, uh, trying to hydrolyze to this alcohol, which is uh, 11 mol tetrahydro uh, cannabinol. This is also an active metabolite. So when this is taken in, it's breaking down, breaking down into this metabolite, and then also further oxidize to this uh, acid. So this one will be absorbed because it's psychoactive, most of it will be absorbed into the brain. But this one, this one will be eliminated. It will be conjugated with gluconolite, uh, glucono, uh, gluconolite acid. Uh, that is, it will be mixed with it as uh, conjugated. I mean, that's the simple way I can put it. Wherever there is gluconolite, there is um, elimination. This is the homeostasis uh, uh, father. So when we get to this uh, acid, it must be eliminated. And most of it is eliminated through the urine. And let me see, those of you uh, interested, this is the diagnostic, this is of diagnostic importance because this one is eliminated in the urine. 40% of it is eliminated in the urine. And it is in the urine that we can detect this substance so that we can say that somebody has taken cannabis. You understand? So we don't just see this delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol or this. This is the metabolite of important that enables we scientists to be able to use uh, uh, our means of uh, that's chromatographic means uh, uh, to get to detect the presence of cannabis in the person's urine. So that is how it is done. So if you look at the picture here, from the lungs is pumped to the it moved to the heart, from the heart to the systemic circulation, and then the liver. In fact, uh, THC is metabolized in the liver. And that is where the cytochrome 2 and then 3A enzymes work on the uh, cannabis uh, uh, metabolites. I mean, to change them into the substances above here, these substances, the acid and then the 11 or tetrahydrocannabinol, which is active. So when this happens, uh, we say that uh, the person has taken cannabinol. You start experiencing uh, the behavioral effect of the drug. So that is it. And that these are the formulas for the cannabinoids. Uh, so that is it. And then, so some key points on cannabis. We say that the active compound in raw wheat or marijuana is THCA, that is the acid, tetrahydrocannabinolic uh, acid. And then we say that the THCA is decarboxylated to THC, tetrahydrocannabinol. So decarboxylation means um, the acid is reduced by taking away carbon dioxide away. Then you get the alcohol group there. So it is done by heating. So that's why those who get the high uh, in the shortest time, uh, those who heat or those who take the smoke cannabis, they get it high, faster. Though it doesn't last as those who take it uh, orally. Those who take it orally, it must pass through uh, certain uh, stages. And then first pass effect uh, must take place before uh, the bioavailability is sometimes low um, in that sense. But it is felt for a long while, 
that's the effect of the drug is felt for a long while because it is released slowly. So the person who takes it orally gets the effect for a long while. But the person who smokes it gets it instantaneously. I mean, he feels the effect immediately, but just that the effect doesn't last. And then the bioavailability is greater in that uh, sense where they smoke. The drug is uh, huge in terms of this uh, active ingredient than the taking it, I mean, orally, because the oral sense, uh, there is first pass effect where some of the metabolites, where the active ingredients will be lost, will be lost in the uh, metabolizing process. So TAC is the potent ingredient that gives the psychoactive effect, such as the euphoria and high uh, feeling that we normally observe in people who take them. Now we're looking at the uh, root of transaction, trafficking. Now, the online trade. I, I, I know most of you might have heard of uh, the online trading, but we have online trading for drugs. And this is just to conceal, to conceal the, the, the work of forensic scientists or detectives or police officers or others. Uh, and then, so the Tor network is an aspect of the internet that employs anonymous software to conceal the identity of the user. So uh, this Tor network, I know some of you knows it already, is a platform that uh, on the internet that employs other uh, anonymous software to conceal people doing this drug trade, illegal trade. It's normally for illegal work. So the Tor network makes use of the dark net. net. Uh, the dark net is different from the net, uh, the, the normal internet we use, the Google and other things, which encrypts uh, communication in order to maintain anonymity. So you'll be trading the drug with um, uh, the trader. You are the buyer, but it's anonymous. Everything is inscripted. And um, there is, it isn't easy for people to trace the path so that they can say that, oh, uh, the IP address uh, is this. So I'm tracing to get the person. No, it is not easy. Now, anonymous online markets accessible exclusively via the dark net enables the purchase of illicit drugs without requiring personal contact with transaction partners. So no personal contact. <laughs> so that is how it is done. The major international tour market was the Silk Road. That was the most popular one. However, I mean, it was launched in 2011, February, but it was shut down by by law enforcement agents in 2013. But, you know, these people, they are very res resilient. <laughs> you close it down, <laughs> they will find a way of what? Bringing that. They are, should I say, they are proactive. Criminals are very proactive. They are not like we, the others, uh, scientists, who are always waiting to uh, uh, get something before we act. No, they are very proactive. They, 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 they make sure that their borders are closed and they reason beyond some of us. I mean, some, some, some of the uh, uh, law enforcement agents. They, they are very smart, you see. So since 2013, hundreds of top market place mimicking Silk Road surface. And these are the Pandora, Agora, Evolution, Aflao, Outlaw. These are marketplaces so these jargons are not just jargons so if you are not a dealer you can't understand this so that is how the online drug market be it a uh, met or cocaine or heroin or morphine and then the roots other route the land sea and then i hope you can see uh this diagram 
um, other illegal routes. Um, now, East and West Africa, trafficking have through illegal routes. You see, mo now what happens is that um, most of the drugs are sent to East Africa from the Latin Americas. So if you look at their graph, uh, the plot here, the figure, you will see this broken arrow. Uh, that one showing the direction pointing to East Africa. So Latin cocaine, mostly uh, the cocaine and then the heroin. But when we come to the others, um, the morphine and other things is the Arab countries because uh, this uh, uh, the plant, uh, the opium poppy plant, they are in Afghanistan, these Arab countries like Afghanistan. So if you look at the top there, you see that cannabis and then metaquilone uh, <clears throat> is transported from Afghanistan to Pakistan, then to East uh, Eastern Africa. Then these are all then sent to the Western Europe and then the United States of America, the red lines. So though they are sent to other countries, but the target place is Western Europe. And then, uh, so you see, Latin America, the border is very tight that you can send these drugs direct to America. So one may say, but that place is closer. But no, they rather use Africa and transport them to the Heathrow and whatever airport. I mean, if in case they are not caught. So that is how the trade is done. And it's a it's very dangerous uh, venture. So um, these are uh, just part of my introduction to enlighten ourselves on how uh, some of these things are done. So um, the problem statement, uh, the drug menace, we say, continue to be a challenge in this country, especially Ghana here, and the world at large, in terms of fighting it. Uh, you all, all bear in mind, I mean, be with me, that uh, of late, the drug menace is just rising, not only in Ghana. I mean, we've experienced a lot. So in a report, the British Crime Survey showed that victims of violent crime believe the offender to be under influence of drugs in 19% of incidents. So the victims believe that those who offended them were under drugs in 19% of incidents. So in 2014, more than uh, this quantity of tramadol, a synthetic opioid, Tramadol is a synthetic opioid, yes. So it's artificial, not natural. And it's under the, um, uh, the fourth, fourth classification. Fourth classification. So Tramadol, I mean, though it is not something uh, that is so abusive, I mean, uh, uh, addictive, it, it only depends on the quantity. That is why it is used for medicinal purpose. You know, but we have changed the direction of use and now abusing it. So schedule four drug uh, for uh, purpose of uh, knowledge is under schedule four. And so they were seized in the joint uh, patrol work at the port, Kotonou and Accra, Benin. So this is West Africa. This drama door, they come, they come. So these are those that were seized. What about those that were not seized? So this is a challenge for me and you to wake up. And we've been seeing them. Tamale here, they burned a lot of them recently. So in Los Angeles, in the United States, 35% of meth users age 18 to 25 year old were found to have committed violence whilst under influence of the drug. This one, uh, as I said earlier on, amphetamine uh, is a medicinal drug. 
I mean, it is used for treatment, but uh, it has been carved out to get a uh, methamphetamine. Methamphetamine is uh, methamphetamine is produced from amphetamine by adding certain dangerous uh, chemicals, and they are all stimulants. They are both stimulants. So one is for medicinal purpose, but it's been abused, and that is how come it is a problem. And in recent times in Ghana, there has been a surge in criminal activities, particularly in larger metropolis. And, you know, armed robbery and then homicide, killing a whole lot. People are just killing people. It's not common for just a normal person to just pick a knife and kill the other. It's not easy. But because of the drugs we have, access to drugs, People have gathered courage with more confidence to do that. Now, the research aim and objective, the main aim was to, of the research was to explore the role of illicit drugs and alcohol use in relation to crime among prison inmates. And some of the specific uh, objectives include to qualitatively determine the presence of drugs of abuse. So we, we, we acid for cannabis, we acid for uh, morphine, uh, cocaine. I mean, in, in one panel, there were four drugs in one panel. So we acid them in the urine of the inmates. And then to in, empirically determine from the interviewee, that's the prison officers, and then the police officers, uh, the prison inmates, sorry, and then the police officers, whether drugs and or alcohol use influence criminality. You see, after doing the qualitative tests and the further uh, uh, confirmation tests, and at the same time, we needed to find out from the, the inmates. You know, they use the drugs, and uh, they are in the same situation. That is why they have been locked up in the prison. So they are able to tell us their story for us to understand the issue or uh, the substance. So we interviewed them to find out whether um, alcohol or drugs influence criminality. And the, the answers, you, you will see them very soon. And then to explore the behavioral effects and crime types caused studies have shown an increase in crime during period of drug use. So uh, it is obvious that where there are I mean, drug use, I mean, there is increase in drug use, crime is common. Crime is very common. And then Neko et al. noted that during periods of narcotic addiction, individual crime lists were six times higher than during non-addiction periods. And this is also obvious. And in 2000, 17% of state prisons and 18% of federal inmates said they committed their current offense to obtain money for the drugs. And I've already mentioned a similar. This was uh, the, the questionnaire and then the testing uh, sample collection uh, that uh, we did. This is the scene, the picture. That shows uh, the prison yard. Uh, that is their clinic, part of their clinic. And uh, we have tried to cover the inmates. It is not proper to show their faces. Uh, so we collected qualitative and quantitative data. And this is a simple uh, diagram protocol of testing for the first preliminary testing. So all the urine were subjected to this preliminary testing. The positive ones were collected and then um, sent to the appropriate quarters. That's GSA. We use the TLC MS, uh, no TLC, and then HPLC MS to assay the positive ones to confirm the presence of these substances. So that was uh, that was done. And those that were negative were not, I mean, uh, confirmed, of, of, of course. 
and results and discussion. So after the immunochemical test for cannabis, morphine, and cocaine among the prison inmates, it was realized that uh, six percent tested for only cannabis. You know, morphine only zero, cocaine only uh, zero, cannabis and morphine we had one uh, zero point six percent, and then cannabis and cocaine zero. You know, it must interest you to know that um, as part of our criteria, we pick inmates that have been in prison for at least one year and um, from the study of uh, drug metabolism and elimination or half-life, uh, it, it tells us that if these substances are still in the uh, body of the inmate, it means something else. It's a different thing altogether. It's either science is lying or otherwise. So uh, from this uh, study, that all types of uses eliminate all metabolites from the system. In late chronic or heavy uses. Within 30 days, all the metabolites should have been eliminated. Then 80 to 90% of THC is excreted from the body within five days as hydrosylated and carboxylated uh, metabolites. So 80 to 90% gone. So we did the confirmation. This is um, HPLC uh, chromatogram. Now it's a pick just for the standard reference standard. The the minutes here is a retention time, and then this side, the absorbance or milli absorbance unit absorbance unit. So we have to use the standard so that uh, we know the range at which our samples will fall. So our sample should fall within the 6.609. So if it doesn't fall within, then it is not cannabis. So we tested all the 6% samples. There are about 10. And then this, I mean, uh, for the sake of time and other things, we chose only two to present. So 6.652 reading that is within the standard and then this one sample two the same thing 6.652 uh, also within the range so the retention time i mean uh, is just within the range as in sample one and two uh, as compared to the standard so um we are answering some of our objectives Inmates' response, uh, drug use and the effect on individual or group criminality. So when you use drugs, what happens? Does it affect criminality? 78% of the inmates responded yes. That uh, when you use drugs, yes, it affects criminality or group criminality. Because from the questionnaire, some of them, most of them, were of the view that, in fact, they pick drug to motivate them to do what they did and then they are in prison. So these are some of the things that uh, we realize. And then from the police too, the police also confirmed that uh, drugs influence criminality. We have strongly agreed about 56 Point five two percent, and then those who agreed, thirty nine point something. So you could see those who were neutral four percent, but we didn't have some who said no. So you can imagine, and then we compare the groupings. Uh, you can see how high it is here. So the the groupings, the respondent 
uh, the response was great. I mean, if you take the average, you can understand. So that is it. And then the behavioral effects of uh, or crime type, uh, the behavior, when you take the drug, what happens to you? So the prisoners answered these questions because there are those who indulge in it. So we look at some of the behavior and then the crime. So violence and aggression, 40.2% accepted that, yes, uh, taking drugs causes violence and aggression. Yes, it is there. Then it makes you high and euphoria in terms of uh, habits. 19.4% chose so. Then if you look at the crime, 5.4% accepted that, yeah, rape. Rape could be a uh, drug, could motivate one to rape. <laughs> but the fact that um, you see, um, the courage and the motivation, the fear element is taken away. So the person gathered the courage to do whatever, uh, I mean, he couldn't have done, I mean, with the naked eye or the mind. And then also robbery. Yeah, most of them go into robbery. You know, high, high um, way robbery, where robbers use machine guns or pump action guns and others, you could see that, look, if you are not under influence, it is not easy to embark on some of these things. And some police people, uh, law enforcement agents, uh, confirm that during search, they find drugs in their uh, 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 items that they search for. And then also theft. Now, the theft, the theft, it could just to support the habit. You know, people who are addicted, as I said earlier, they, they, they need to continue with the habit and therefore they have to steal, pickpocket, I mean, burglary, they will break through your window and pick something and then go and sell. So 10.2% accepted that it is true. They need to... Uh, I mean, continue with the habit. So sometimes they still to do that. Then MEDA, 7.6 confirmed that, yes, MEDA, people taking drugs before they can stand that courage to kill or to cause homicide. So it is not just with the uh, bare fact that, oh, I'm a human being, I can do it. No, it's not easy. Just looking at somebody and then, butchering the person. It is not easy. And then also uh, the sedative effect. Yeah, 10% is part of the, this part of the behavioral. Drugs calm them and sedate them. Especially some of the cannabis, uh, they calm them and then most of the analgesic uh, heroin and, you know, heroin is a depressant. So they tend to depress um uh, the, the uh, central nervous system, so that um, you 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 are inactive. You understand? Unlike the stimulants, uh, stimulant like the meth, uh, the cocaine, whether the crack or the raw, these are stimulants, and they stimulate. They make the central nervous system work faster. So a state of tachycardia, they had to. Will, will, will work faster than normal. So if you see somebody who have taken cocaine immediately, you can feel the high. The person work hard. If you remember Maradona uh, used to uh, dope cocaine and he would run tirelessly on the field. And you can imagine eh, until he was caught. You see? So in sport cheating, those of you who are interested in uh, doping, Doping, as a forensic scientist, I mean, it's a new venture. Uh, you can also help in, I mean, organizing uh, these diagnostic kits to test for doping in our Premier League. It is helping a lot. I mean, it uh, because uh, I remember the, the, the president of WADA, that's World Anti-Doping Agency, was in Ghana last year. And, and, and it was nice. I mean, we have to establish one here.
here. Uh, I'm putting it before some of you to start uh, exercising that doping. So people dope and they cheat. They cheat in sports. So you could see somebody running faster. And we have countless number of them in cycling, in football, in athletic, a whole lot of uh, uh, um, events that we, 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 we normally see people dope and being caught, yes. And we have different type of doping uh, agents. But here we are talking about drugs. So the behavioral uh, effects and crime types uh, influenced by illicit drug use. So, but in general, alcohol abuses are known to cause aggression and violent behavior in their society. Yes, people who abuse alcohol a lot, yes, um, in most cases, causes a lot of violence. In fact, that is a fact. Um, so, in conclusion, uh, from the study, we, we, we saw that 6% of the inmates were tested positive for cannabis. Cannabis use, while 0.6% tested both morphine and cannabis. Uh, it was also revealed that illicit substance use had both behavioral and psychological effect on their user. And then the result obtained from this work, supported by other literature, is uh, based to suggest that the use of illicit substance have a relation in criminal offending and can therefore motivate or influence one to uh, commit crime. So in recommendation, the work in future should be expanded to include the other major prisons across uh, the country. So these are my references. So um, thank you for being my guest. Uh, uh, enjoy the rest of the weekend. So um, I'm, I'm turning this off and then asking for questions, although I have your uh, some of your comments here, uh, maybe fresh ones might be in, so that we'll see how we can address them together. So, MK, over to you. Thank you. All right, so, All right, so thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Before we can move on into onto the conclusion session, I would like you to, um, as we just said, start with the questions that you have over at your end. After addressing them, then we now open the floor to the audience. If they have any other questions, then we can address them, then move forward to closure. Thank you. Once again. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, um, from the audience um, comment session, I think... <coughs> We had uh, quite a number of them. One wanted to find out the prospect of forensic science in Ghana. Uh, in Ghana. Prospect. Uh, so prospect. So it is clear. Forensic science is a green area. And then um, let me tell you that um, it is and a good venture to be in that film because it has a whole wide co coverage. I mean, it's a non-stop. Everywhere a forensic scientist can work in. So uh, you can be an investigator in any direction, either document examination of, I mean, uh, scientists or any of the investigation that is criminal, you can be called upon. You can't work in the forensic laboratories, police office, uh, hospitals, insurance company, military, toxicologists, you know, the work of a toxicology detective, um, and the whole lot teaching, fire, and uh, prison warden. So these are some of the prospects. So the one who asks uh, about the prospects, uh, these are they are limit. Uh, they are they are they are not limited. They are more, and I think we can add ours. I mean, and then also new technologies used in drug analysis. In fact, the person wanted to find out if there could be simple tools 
uh, so that you will send samples to the laboratory to analyze them. Yes, uh, there are. Uh, you want it convenient so that when you get the person, you just plug and then you get the results. Yes, we have, um, you know, the conventional ones we all know are still good, very efficient, that the LS, uh, liquid chromatography MS, gas chromatography MS, and the HPLC MS, they are very good and they are the gold standard. But uh, these uh, tools that you are talking of, uh, like uh, they are just um, uh, sensors, sens sensor-like tools, like the electrochemical sensors. And if you work in the lab before, we have a um, glucometer. The glucometer, we use it to check for sugar. And it's the same technology embedded in uh, some of these uh, electrochemical sensors for drug, uh, ana I mean, analysis. And then optical sensors, based on optical uh, uh, changes, light, like light absorption, fluorescence, refractive index, and luminescence. And these are all uh, available, provided you can afford them. Uh -huh. So these are some of them. So the electrochemical sensors and then the optical sensors, they are those available now that I can. And then breathalyzer, breathalyzer for alcohol detection. So people who normally uh, involve themselves in alcohol crime, uh, driving under influence, normally uh, I use, I mean, the breathalyzer is used to uh, uh, arrest some of them. In Ghana, you know, uh, the alcohol consumption limit before you can drive, the blood alcohol level is 0.08%. So if it exceeds that, and I know most countries in the world to uh, follow the same suit, but if it has, I mean, exceeds that, then you are in trouble. So the breathalyzer too is one. Then impact of analytical chemistry in drug investigation or forensic. You know, any work that make use of identification and quantification requires an analytical chemist. So there is no way that as an analytical chemist, analytical chemist does, you are just a forensic scientist. Analytical chemist is part of forensic. So, uh, using GCMS and other uh, equipment to analyze for a particular unknown substance and the rest is the work of uh, a forensic scientist as an analytical chemist. So um, these were those uh, I got. And the others, others seem um, MK. Hello, MK. Yeah, loud and clear. Yeah, loud and clear. I can hear you. Yeah, is there is, is there any new ones that we can follow? Um, I think um, I think you mentioned almost all of them, right? Yes, because basically the others, um, the others were just um, items I addressed during the session. You know, I addressed certain things, and I hope. Address those ones. They were so basic. Okay, and there's, I don't and there's a hand too. Maybe you could address the hand and we. No problem. Proceed. Yes. Um, yes. Um, please, Mr. Please, Mr. Abuko, you may ask your question. I can see your hands are raised. You may turn on the mic. Turn on the mic and speak. Okay. Thank you, Sir Lawrence, for the presentation. Uh, I think it's a very nice presentation, and um, we, a lot have been learned. But I have a few questions that uh, I would like to get clarification to in regards to the presentation. Okay. That I have to do. My first question has to do with uh, the preliminary tests that were performed on the urine before it was sent to the GSA sure. for analysis, because I didn't actually hear anything on that 
And also, in your conclusion, you made it clear that 0.6% use this cannabis. But, um, and that is supposed to be. What I'm looking at, about, yeah, I second that particular uh, mushi, let me put it that way, with a sense that I was thinking we could have gotten a higher percentage when we use hair. Because in your conclusion, we're talking about doping in, in sports. And we know that in hair analysis, the hair can contain these particular drugs for over a year. And if you look at your time limit, you made mention of uh, inmates that were one, one year and above sample that you collected. So I was thinking if we could analyze their hair, that, that would give us a very large percentage. And it's probably, who knows, we might find some other drugs that may not uh, uh, disappear in the system for very long time. Because if you use urine, yes, we know, after um, uh, metabol metabolism of the, uh, of the drug, which take place in the liver, yes, the end product which have to be excreted in the urine. So we have, as you said, you said we have forty percent moving to the urine, which means the sixty percent is somewhere or it it will be absorbed. Let me put it that way. Uh -huh. So I was thinking, if we use hair, it will it will make uh, the percentage increase, and it also help us also get more of the drugs as compared to the ones that we've gotten. And I think look by the doping that you've talked about. Uh, I think we should be looking in the direction of hair analysis since it can contain more of the drug for uh, a longer period of time. Okay. That is just my question and so a suggestion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Baita, for this suggestion and then the question. Um, let me get to the other one um, for clarification. Um, we use the urine not for convenience sake. In fact, convenience sake too might be part, yes, but our aim was to know what's in the prisons, whether people are still using the drugs or not. That was the reason why we used the, uh, the urine. Because in the normal circumstance, uh, people who are under lock and keys, we shouldn't find some of these substances in their urine. Like you said, for hair, it can contain for more. It's because the metabolite, the metabolite of the, um, the substance, especially we're talking about cannabis, uh, they are, I mean, fat. They, they always remain the fat or uh, tissue perfusion, or let's say fat for long. So they, 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 when they are in the fat cells, they keep longer than, I mean, when they are in the other system, uh, non-fatty cells. And you know, uh, TAC is uh, high, it's not hydrophobic. Uh, it's high, more hydrophilic than the other one. So that is that one. Then also, um, yes, for the hair, I'm not discarding it. You know, it's a research work. So you see, immediately after my rework, um, a namesake of mine, Dr. Lawrence, also contacted me. I remember 2019 on the work. And he also did a similar work, but he used hair. He works with the prisons. He's a medical doctor. He works uh, with the prisons, but he uses hair. So it depends on your objective, what you want. That will direct you to what you want to do. Then also, the last thing is that, you see, the 60%, you know, the metabolite, the active one, most of them is uh, used by the brain, and most of them, I mean, goes to the feces. That, not that it just, it just remains in the system, no. It is discarded in the feces. More than 60% of the metabolites are discarded in the feces, and then 40% in the urine. That's why we chose that. Uh, it isn't that uh, the cannabis will remain in the body for long, no. 
So that is it. I hope I'm right. Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, yes. Initially, I didn't get uh, the clarification. It, it was after my question and then your first response, which was you wanted to know whether they are still having access to the drug in the prison. That is when I get everything right. So thank you very much. I'm okay. Thank, thank you very much. Yes, but hey, please, a, a, a quick one. The preliminary yes. test. Okay. Yeah. The preliminary test that was performed on the urine, I want to know the, yes, the, yes. the method that was used. Yeah. So we use uh, the immunochemical uh, uh, kits. Um, okay. Four in one panel. Uh, for the, I hope I could have shown it. The picture is here, but not on my, uh, this new laptop is. So mm -hmm. that is the, the, the kit we use for the preliminary testing. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So any other MK? Okay someone, okay, someone also wanted to know in the chat box, will the slide be made, um, be made available for them? Oh, sure. Okay, all right. So, the slides will be made available to the audience. And we have um, Mr. Joseph Hans. Please, you may put on the mic and speak. Okay, thank you very much, um, Dr. Lawrence, for that insightful presentation. I, I would like to know some of the challenges you encountered whilst dealing with the prisoners. Uh, what were some of the challenges that you encountered? Thank you. Okay. Well, um, um, you know, in Ghana here, when you are assessing someone's environment, you first need to knock. When you knock, whether they open you or not, that is another thing. But um, the challenge, in fact, in every situation, uh, there are challenges. But what I think was the challenge was, you know, trying to get the response. In fact, the police, the police side was a big challenge. The cooperation, you know, you won't get it straightforward. I wrote for ethical clearance. I got ethical clearance from NUST, my school. Then from there, um, permission to carry on the work. But then the IGP, no, uh, with the police, the police, <laughs> they accepted it, but it was oral. I mean, the permission, I don't know how it was, but <laughs> I don't want to mention it in all their cases. But the prison command, uh, the response came from Makra easily, and then um, they gave us the permission to do it. And then also uh, getting the cooperation. You know, uh, you must spend, you know, you must spend getting people to help you within the prison because you can't carry people outside into the prison. You have to use the clinicians and you have to spend on them every day, any time that you are taking your samples. And then, so those were the challenges. I, I don't know if there are other challenges uh, you might want uh, to, to, to add, uh, me to add, but specifically these were the challenges. After getting my letter of go ahead, I started the work. And then also, let's say, in terms of um, uh, carrying out the confirmation test to uh, it comes with huge cost. It comes with huge cost. I mean, you have to do extraction, you have to do TLC, you have to finish, use all of the sample for the HPLC, and in all, each each sample costs a lot. Whilst you are working, uh, I mean, by yourself, you yourself working on your samples, but analyzing, analyzing them, very easy, very costly. Mm -hmm. So that is it. Yes. So, uh, yeah. Uh, Joseph Jagri, right? Yeah. 
Um, so adding up to the challenges you just asked, um, what were the challenges in terms of like the inmate corporations? Like what were the prisoners themselves? Like did they give you any form of challenges here? The, as for the inmates, you know, because they are in a vulnerable situation, yeah? So uh, some of them, some of them, some of them, a few of them were afraid. They were thinking that you are coming to do something else. And then others were thinking that, oh, researchers have been visiting us. We don't see anything. So they used to think that when you come, you are trying to help them get out of jail. <laughs> but uh, that isn't the case. Uh, it's a research work. Uh, where we had the challenge was the, uh, the female side. The female side, though we were able to break through, but the resistance was a bit, a bit much. <laughs> but for the male side, uh, we didn't get a big challenge like that. They were cooperative. In fact, they were cooperative. And then the officers too on duty at the clinic too cooperated a lot. Though you have to spend something on them, but that is normal. I mean, in every situation. Okay, so any other? MK? Yeah, please. Yeah, please, the um, floor is still open. If there's any other question from the audience, you may raise up your hands or just um, talk directly by putting on your mic. You can also put your questions in the chat box. So let me confirm from the chat box if you have any more questions that have not yet been solved. Okay, I think there are no more questions. But do, you still have but do you still have any questions at your end that you would like to address? Myself? Yes, please. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes. Uh, if if there are no questions, then I will ask questions. So, um, I know some of you are researchers. Uh, others are students uh, because I can see about one or two of my students here. Uh, how 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 possible is it that um, the inmates uh, get these drugs? How possible? How do they get these drugs? So that's my question. And anyone can, I mean, answer. Yeah, Joseph, please, you may answer the question. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, Doc, I think they get these drugs from the prison officers themselves. Because there was one time I had an encounter with some of them, like, at Cape Coast, while on campus. And it was like, those that have the opportunity to come out and do this hard labor, like digging, digging of foundations, they, that is where they actually, like, they get some of these things. So the officers are able to supply it to them. So I think they get it from the officers themselves. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I think... Um, okay. I think um, these are some of them. That's why I wanted it from you, the audience. <laughs> I don't want to put it across. You understand? Or you can also shed, or you can shed more lights on it too, like um, ways of possible oh, means. Because you know, I believe they may have several ways of getting it, not just one particular. Yeah, that is MK. That is exactly what uh, happened when we, I mean, we interviewed the inmates. They made themselves confirm it. You understand? They meet themselves confirm that, um, like how uh, Joseph Jagri kept it. So it's just the same thing. I just wanted to know if they had the knowledge of it and truly they have it. <laughs> so I think it is right. 
It is right. Uh, so I, I wanted my students to say something, to ask questions, but they are not asking me. Am I free to ask them questions? <laughs> Um, um, I think if you ask them the questions next time, we will not have them joining the session. So, oh no, it's a, it's, 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 it's a cool question, Sally. I can see Sally here. Fatal, are you online? Lucy, Lucy. Yes, please. I'm here. Oh, okay. It's good you are online. So it means you are paying attention. You don't have any question, right? No, I don't have any question. Okay, okay. So should I ask you a question? <laughs> okay, so that's by, by the way. So uh, in summary, uh, we talked about, if there is no any other question, uh, in summary, uh, this um, uh, something that uh, we did, and then um, it was on this, our drugs and alcohol and the crime that are related um, to them. Please, Mr. Desmond, um, it seems your hand is up. You may put on the mic and then ask your query. Okay. Uh, Mr. Lawrence. Hello. Yes. Please, I want to ask that since since they know uh, the the illegal route of transporting their drugs, where is it that uh, yes, to it has uh, it hasn't been worked on? <laughs> because you may mention of uh, uh, places like Aflau and stuffs and the illegal routes are like based on the diagram you showed. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So, okay. So, so since so since all this has been captured, at uh, at least like there's something that must be done. Yeah, there you see. Uh, uh, are you done? Okay. That is the those were the online um, trade markets. The aflao you 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 saw on the presentation isn't the uh, the physical aflao in Ghana. I mean, in Ghana, is it Ghana Togo border, right? Is it Ghana Togo or Benin border? Actually, the Aflao, Aflao is a marketplace online. It's a, it's a street name, like a jargon, a market name in the dark world. I mean, dark neck, uh, ne uh, uh, net, yeah, where they do the trading. And I, I mentioned earlier on that it is not easy to, to get these uh, guys when they are in the dark world. Immediate uh, for when you clamp down one, they will open another one. That's why I mentioned that they are very proactive. They they are smarter than most of the law enforcement agents, so they move faster. They are they, they think faster. They get information faster, so they plan ahead. Uh huh. So it isn't that it is just a flower. But you see, in Ghana here we have a lot of places. Where they trade, uh, uh, what do you call it? Cocaine, and we all know that cocaine is highly abusive, addictive drug. But we have places in Kumasi. During my interview, I saw I interviewed the 18 year old boy, 18 year, eh? 18 years old guy who was a cocaine addict, and he was in prison because of his dealing in cocaine. You understand? They were able to tell me where the spot where they sell the cocaine in Kumase. You understand? And in Tamale here, if you follow up, you'll be able to know some IGS and co who are dealing in cocaine and tramadol. So it is something that I mean, it isn't that we don't know. We know they are caring. But what can we do? People are dealing in sex drugs and I mean. You know the, I mean the corruption. When corruption is into play, you know what happens. So you can, you can, you can understand. So, uh, Doctor Veta, are you okay? But I am not the one. No, it's my, it's my younger one. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. This one. 
the two of you. <laughs> okay, anyway, I've been able to distinguish the two. So that is it for now. Uh, Desmond, are you okay? Yes, please. But I still, I still want to ask another question. Okay. You made, you made, uh, you asked a question like, how do the prisoners get like the drugs? Okay. And, and I think, and I think Mr. Joseph said, when they go out for labor work, they do get that. And I want to ask uh, that uh, when uh, when a friend or a relative brings food to them. And uh, let me say, let me say, and the drugs is being uh, placed inside the food. How 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 are they going to know? I mean, like I mean the I mean the prison officers. Okay. Do they have Do they have anything to de uh, like to test immediately to know whether uh, to know whether something uh, to to know whether the drug is uh, is in the food or not? Okay. Yes, and uh, and and I want to know like. I, I, I want to know if, like, I want to know if they have any, uh, any, any, any instrument used to detect uh, the, the like the drug. Drugs. Yes, immediately. Oh, okay, yeah. that's good. Thank, uh, you. thank you. It's a nice question, but this question I've been asked and asked and asked. You know, in the prisons, um, they've been arresting people. Uh, I don't know whether we call uh, what should we call the relatives, eh? Whether relatives who bring food to uh, prisoners, I mean, who are closer to them, and sometimes they search, they 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 make sure that in your presence you open the food, you taste it, to make sure that you are not going to poison someone, and then also to search for. And most at times, they used to uh, apprehend people. I mean, they used to arrest people because uh, there have been several occasions that uh, they find other drugs, though not tested, you know, cannabis. You know, until they got, I mean, the prison officers uh, got to know the, that this is how, I mean, what people do. Then they twisted and changed their ways. Otherwise, they used to put maybe banku, then they will put the wee inside. You understand? So to 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 skip being, I mean, uh, uh, detected, and then so this this thing they do happen, but now it is not easy. It is not easy, and then also concerning um, the testing. You see, I can tell you that the prison office. They don't do this testing there. They don't have that uh, capability. You know, the drug, if it is a leaf suspected to be cannabis, look at even the police, a leaf cons I mean, suspected to be cannabis. So the narcotic units of the police will pass out this leaf suspected to be cannabis to Accra for them to detect. <laughs> Otherwise, they could have been a presumptive test, I mean, for cannabis. And any of my students, when given the opportunity, should be able to do that. That is why you people need to come out, you know. Sometimes with a private forensic laboratory, you could be, I mean, you'll be able to stand in that position to do some of these tests. You don't need to let them travel the substance to Accra. Standards Authority or Police Forensic Lab for them to detect whether it is cannabis, yeah, is cannabis or not cannabis. So uh, they, are, they don't have that uh, capability there. The capacity is not there. Not, not, not even in the police, except their major laboratories. Yes. Are you okay, Desmond? Yes, please. Okay. MK, is there any other? Um, um, for now, I don't think so. And we have, let's say, about five minutes past our time. Okay. So I'd like us to end the session here. And you can share with us your email in the chat box so that if anyone has any further questions, they can reach out to you.
Okay. Um, kindly share your info. So please, if there's any other further questions in relation to um what we just had or anything at, um close to the area, you may reach out to Mr. Lawrence for further clarification. Thank you. The slides will be shared. Um, so if you are on WhatsApp, you can just um. I don't know. Uh, if you are on WhatsApp and when you are on your platform, we share it on our the forensic post um WhatsApp page. If you are also on the platform, to kindly um DM me directly or Mr. Lawrence, then he would hand over your number to me, and I'll add you to our page so that you can get the slides when it is being shared, or you can also share your email um to us, then we will share it to you. Or better still, or better still since you have Mr. Lawrence's email on the chat box, you can just ask him directly. You email him and then he will share the slides with you if you are on this page. Um, so thank you all for joining and staying with us throughout the session. We appreciate your time and then all the contribution and the question and the queries that were being um, asked. We I really appreciate all of them. And hopefully in two weeks' time, we'll be having another session um, that is our episode 11. So if you are not following us on any of our platform, especially on LinkedIn or, or WhatsApp, kindly try to join our page on WhatsApp or follow us on LinkedIn so that you can get updates on our upcoming session. So thank you all for joining. Mr. Lawrence, thank you so much for this beautiful and wonderful session. I believe each and every one of us here had learned at least um, one or two things, and then we really appreciate your time and effort may god bless you looking forward to and looking you. Thank forward you. to have you in future to talk about something and um something else any other topic within your area of special um specializations thank you so much and have a great day all of you bye for now, bye for now. thank you thank you